Trigger warning, this podcast episode contains discussions of divorcing an emotional or narcissistic abuser. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds, and I'm so glad you're here. To those who celebrate, I hope you had a lovely Thanksgiving last week. I've got some new episodes coming up over the next few weeks, and then Emotional Abuse is Real will be taking another brief hiatus until early 2024. So here is my usual reminder that Emotional Abuse is Real still needs your support, and there are several ways you can do that. First of all, if you're a listener and you'd like to share your story, please don't hesitate to reach out via Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. That's S-A-R-E-N-E-L-E-E-D-S-W-R-I-T-E-S. Or feel free to reach out via our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real, or via email at hello at sereneleadsrights.com. A reminder that anonymous guests are always welcome. Another way you can support Emotional Abuse is Real is by heading over to Apple Podcasts and both leaving a rating and writing a review. The more reviews we get, the easier it is for people to find this podcast. Finally, you can support the podcast by following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights, following our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real. And if you are able, please consider donating to our Buy Me a Coffee page, which I've linked in the show notes. As I've said before, this is a one-woman operation, and your donations help fund the podcast's production costs. I'd also like to remind you about my free newsletter. This is a great opportunity to stay up to date on my latest published articles, as well as new podcast episodes. Also, it's a wonderful way to stay in touch with me directly, especially if you are a business or brand owner looking to punch up your website, email, or social media copy. I am available to work with you on any writing or editing you may need with your business and brand copy. Plus, as an added bonus, I sent out a free, delicious dessert recipe to every new subscriber. I've left the sign-up link in the show notes. You can also subscribe directly via my website, sereneleadsrights.com. On sereneleadsrights.com, you can also find several testimonials from current and former clients. My guests for today's episode are Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger of Jacobs Berger, LLC. Sarah and Jamie represent a new kind of guest for this podcast because they're not emotional abuse survivors or mental health professionals. They are, in fact, family law attorneys who specialize in high-conflict divorces involving narcissistic abusers. I am so excited to share my interview with Sarah and Jamie, as they provide not only fascinating insights into the process of divorcing a narcissistic partner, but they also offer expert tips for those contemplating separation. So without further ado, Here's my conversation with Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger. Hi, I'm Sarah Jacobs. I'm co-founder of Jacobs Berger in Morristown, New Jersey, and I'm here today with my partner, Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Berger, and I'm one of the co-founders of Jacobs Berger. We are a family law practice located in Morristown, New Jersey, and we are thrilled to be here today talking about this important topic. Oh, I'm so happy you're both here uh, because while I've had lots of narcissistic and emotional emotional abuse survivors and mental health professionals as guests on this podcast, I've yet to welcome diver- divorce attorneys. And for anyone who has listened to this podcast, they know that separating from and ultimately divorcing a narcissist or an emotional abuser is extremely difficult and complicated. So you both specialize in helping clients that are divorcing a narcissistic abuser, which is slowly becoming a more recognizable field as victims need a support network of people who specifically understand what they're going through. So I'm going to start things off by asking you how you both decided to specialize in this particular kind of divorce. 
So I, I'll kick it off. I think it happened somewhat organically, you know, based on our, our years of collective experience, um, you know, dealing with all types of, you know, personality disorders and mental health professionals. And, you know, when we started to Sarah and I talk about this, um, you know, we we realized that there was this this white space um, in the attorneys that really understand, um, you know, what what, uh, you know, narcissistic personality disorder is what it isn't. You know, it's it's a phrase that's thrown around a lot. You know, somebody's a narcissist. Yes. You know, somebody can have narcissistic tendencies and, you know, traits, but not be a clinical narcissist. And so just understanding the the nuances and and talking to mental health professionals and like you said, you know that that really understanding the disorder and and understanding how to advocate for a client who has been in this toxic relationship with a person who who will never acknowledge that they're toxic. Um, and, right. and how do you extract them from that and and get them through um, and and it and have them understand the difficulties that they're going to encounter in the process because yeah. of the personality type on the other side. And so it really I again it happened somewhat organically, but it yeah. um it it feels for us very um important to understand, you know, how to help people who are in these, in these situations. Sure. Uh, Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, No, Jamie, very eloquently explained (laughs) a lot of the, the, the mindset behind it. I I think she touched on it briefly in, in the idea that the system and, and by system court, court system, legal system, adversarial system Mm -hmm. is not built for the psychology behind extricating yourself from a toxic relationship. In Mm -hmm. fact, it's directly contrary to Mm -hmm. the mindset. So when we're having these conversations with clients and, and we found in our own conversations with therapists, what the system demands and what the psychology demands are none of a meeting road. And so we've we've tried to really think about how to do our jobs effectively within the constraints that the system has provided, but arm our clients with the toolbox that their psychology, their therapeutic resources, you know, all the literature suggests is necessary for for extraction, as Jamie said. But how how to walk that through in a minefield where you're stepping on the opposite, you know, bomb in any given moment by speaking to the court, speaking to the adversary, et cetera. So it, it's, it's a delicate balance and mm-hmm. it's something that we've had, we've developed in our mindset and then have had to try to educate our clients at the same time with. Sure. Sure. Um, it's a lot, um, no doubt. So, so you mentioned, uh, the toolbox. So say someone is gearing up for, for a divorce from their narcissistic partner, what are the first steps they should take before telling their spouse that it's over? I'll I'll handle that one. I I actually think that, um, I mean, there's a, there's a list that as a divorce attorney, we would tell them just specifically from the divorce side, Mm-hmm. information, financial documentation, gathering, data, right? As the yep. mo- more data you have, the easier it is to go through the divorce. But from my mindset, at least, and I think Jamie agrees with me, but she'll she'll definitely <laughs> chime in one way or another. Um, I Mindset is key here. Like okay. you have to understand what we sort of just explained, that the system is not built for this and that mm-hmm. it is going to be incredibly frustrating. It is mm-hmm. going to feel like, you are not succeeding in what you want. And I think yeah. what I usually tell my clients is you need to define your win because mm-hmm. what we've learned in dealing with a narcissist is they will win in, in the traditional sense of winning because mm-hmm. you cannot defeat them without removing yourself from the game, right? Because it's their game to play. So in terms of a win from a from a black and white perspective, generally speaking, when you stop playing, they win the tangible item that may be on the table that feels unfair. 
but you win the larger mindset of extricating yourself from the relationship. And that is a very difficult shift when you have very palpable things on the table like money and children and assets. It's hard to walk away from the, but it's unfair. It, it is going to be unfair when you're in a relationship with a narcissist. That's, that's, that's the primary under, underpinning of the dynamic. Of course, of course. Yeah, the the only thing that I will I will add, and I think you know Sarah Sarah covered it. You know, obviously making sure that they have the outside therapeutic elements in place that they're talking to somebody, they have support. You know, yeah. um, while we are while we are certainly versed specifically in this area and the psychology and the you know the understanding of the the, the mental health issue that is that is pervasive in their relationship, we're not therapists. We're not, you know, that's not what we're trained to do. We're trained advocates um, with an understanding. And so, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to confuse those. You don't, you don't want to confuse your divorce attorney who may have that understanding with, with a therapist, but also um, make sure you're talking to the right attorneys. Like, you know, listen, there, there are certain, and I, I, I said it before, there are buzzwords, like there are things that people throw out, but, but unless you have, you know, unless you're, you're talking to an attorney who has an understanding of like what this really is and isn't, um, you know, it, it's easy, it's easy to, to, it's easy to, to choose an attorney who may allow your spouse to continue the abusive cycle that you've been in because to Sarah's point, the, the system isn't built for it. And so, um, that, that we, we take over a lot of cases, um, where that has been, and I'm, you know, it's like set your attorney should set the same boundaries that you're setting. Your attorney should be, you know, because that's that is that's a really important piece of the process for our clients. OK, I'm really glad that you brought up um, just the reminder that the client should be working with a mental health professional, because even though you you both as attorneys have an understanding of the situation, like you said, you're advocates, you are not therapists. But on the attorney side of things, so what should a client look for in the, the quote unquote right attorney in a situation like this? I think I think the first thing that you have to look for as a client is someone that you can talk to and that you can hear. And mm-hmm. obviously, as Jamie said, not necessarily in, in a venting therapeutic sense, but in someone who speaks your language, who mm-hmm. you can process information from, who is actually listening to you when you're speaking and not speaking at you or to you. Yes. I think in this space, you also want to look for an attorney who, as Jamie said, does understand the dynamics of what the what a true classic diagnosis of NPD means or a mm-hmm. you know, borderline or any other toxic personality that has this kind of um, abusive uh, cycle to it, but who understands how to translate that into action within the legal space for you. Because ultimately, as Jamie said, it is our job to you know, litigate you out of this. And if you choose, if someone doesn't really understand what they're facing, their litigation choices, their strategic choices, their way of managing the other personalities involved in the case, the adverse uh, attorney, the adverse client, the judge, you know, any custody evaluators, et cetera, et cetera. um, It, it undermines the work that you as an individual client are doing in your therapeutic process and also like what you need for your life. So you want them to complement each other, not um, oppose each other in, in the way that you have, you're educating your client on, on moving through the divorce. Okay. Awesome. And so what are some of the most common mistakes that people or rather clients make when dealing with a narcissistic partner? Um, I think, I think, you know, a not, not understanding the, the disorder, not understanding um, that there's their perception of the situation is their reality. And it's so ingrained in who they are and what they believe that there's no, there's no convincing 
you can't convince a narcissist that they're a narcissist unless they've right. done the 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 true work that it takes to to handle and so it's it but we see we see clients who who come out and feel you know it's the first time that they've sort of gotten a little bit of space from the person that has been abusing them over you know the the course of years and they want to scream it from the rooftops and they want they want they want to convince everybody around them that this person you know is a narcissist and it's you you can do that um and you can spend your energy doing that or you can understand it and understand that doing like it it's it's that's not necessarily going to get you out of the situation as much as as um you know so just having having that those real conversations with clients and you know that that understanding i think helps mm-hmm. um but it's you know they they allow they allow the abuse to continue because they don't know how to how to get themselves out of the situation like they yeah. they're just they're so used to it and it's yeah. you know it they've they've been in this fight or flight situation for as long as they have. And it's, it, it's, it's hard to get out of that mindset. So we see, we just see in early stages, um, you know, and it's nice for us as attorneys on, on some level, because you see the progression of your clients, you see the understanding, you see the moments where they're like, Oh, that, you know, and (laughs) the light bulb moment. Yeah. And, and you like, the, the person who walked into your office is very different than the person, you know, leaving your office, however many months later. And so sure. um, it's an interesting progression to see. But I think I think it's just kind of continuing to wade in the dysfunction and the toxicity and not and not acknowledge that it exists, but not because of them, because of something that is outside of their control. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I just Sarah, if I wanted to give you an opportunity, if you had anything to add. I, I think Jamie hit the nail on the head. I think yeah. the only the only side ca- caveat to that is recognizing that the system is not going to be their savior. Right, the system yeah. is not going to be the place where like this, you know, halo of light shines mm-hmm. on the narcissist, showing them to the world for everything that you know this the client has seen, yeah. because the system, as we said, is inherently not built for that. The system is built for the narcissist to thrive yeah. because the system is built on engagement and, you know, dysfunction and constant gray area, especially in divorce and family law, because, you know, it's so fact sensitive and so emotionally driven that this is the narcissist's playground. And so mm-hmm. to come into it with the idea that somehow the world is going to see what you've seen is actually the exact opposite of what you should be doing. And you should be looking at how to extricate yourself, not only from the relationship, but the system as fast as possible to cut the narcissist off at their knees. Absolutely. And it's the same in a workplace situation. My emotional abuse situation was a workplace situation. And here I thought human resources was going to save me. No, (laughs) that was a huge wake up call for me, how they were there to protect the company. They were not there to protect me. And so... So it's interesting to hear, it, although not surprising, that the legal system is very similar. <laughs> so um, to perhaps help people who are in these situations, what are some of the telltale signs that you could be divorcing a narcissist? You know, I, you know, and, and listen, again, and we have to separate, you know, narcissistic personality traits yes. from the actual disorder itself. Of course. But um, you know, the 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 telltale signs are that, you know, that that lack of empathy, lack yes. of, you know, understanding, um the the self-importance, you know, they're the only person in the room. They're the smartest mm-hmm. person in the room. They're the, you know, the nobody their their attorney doesn't, you know, doesn't know better than them. They know better than their attorney. They know better than the judge. They know better than the mediator. So nobody's going to convince them that they're wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, certainly, you know, there's, there's lack of boundaries, gaslighting, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's so many. And I know, know. (laughs) and and you know, the interesting part of, of this really all personality disorders is that they, they present so differently in, yeah. in people, you know, it's not, yeah. it's, it's, um, 
I, I I'll give the example. I, I had a you know I had a case where the the wife wasn't a clinical. I mean, I'm not I'm not I can't diagnose her. I'm not a mental health professional, but but it was it was very obvious. Yes, and um, she's she did something interesting at the beginning of the case. She put um, on the family shared calendar. She put that she was going to a victims of of a narcissist vic- like divorce oh, you know wow. support group. And it was just really, you know, and it was in her mind because she had that victim mentality. She had, you know, the, in her mind, she was the victim and nobody was going to convince her otherwise. Yeah. Um, and it got to the point where I had to say to my client, you need to stop trying to convince her that because you're, you're, you're wasting all of your energy. And so those, I mean, those are really, you know, those are the things that, that I look for in my conversations with clients where I'm like, okay, you know, there's, you got like your little checkbox and your, um, you know, and, you know, but, but again, it's, I think because Sarah and I have a unique understanding of personality disorders like this, that Mm -hmm. it it allows us to, you know, listen for certain things in a conversation with a client that are very odd obvious, but to us maybe, but not other attorneys that don't, that don't have that. Sure. I think one of the other key, key areas, and it's hard in, in what we do because in a, I'll call it quote, regular divorce, not that there's such a thing, but maybe yeah. in a divorce that's either high conflict or that is, you know, hard fought um, where emotions run high and the, the issues are complex, but that is, absent a personality disorder such as this that complicates it, there can be a lack of of willingness on either side to sort of come to conclusion or like resolve something. But there's some level of logical speak that you can have with one or both parties where the cost benefit analysis sort of of their own particular desires weighs out and you can get them to a conclusion. With someone in this personality space, it never ends. There is always something more. There is always something different. Even yes. if it, the resolution was their idea and the, your client agrees to it, now the deal is different and there's something else. And it 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 is just, there can be no end to this game because that's how they thrive. They thrive off of the engagement. They thrive off the manipulation. Yeah. They thrive off the it, the communication, whether it's from the client or not. And so really recognizing where there is a an issue in a regular case, and again, I use that word yeah. harshly, but it, in a case where this personality sort of complicates it, you have to understand it to see where that line is and to be able to say to your client, like, Something has to give here. And unfortunately, as unfair as it may be, you are the one that has to give because they yeah. will not and they cannot. Cool. And yeah. One of the other things, and I and I tell clients this all the time, um, is that I I make a prediction at the outset of a case and I say the attorney that they have now will not be their attorney in in two months, three months six months, whatever the time frame is, because I I can see that, you know, as soon as that attorney challenges them, as soon as that attorney, um, you know, starts to question the foundations of their personality um, in some way, they will, they, they will feel that abandonment. They will feel that, you know, they're, they will go into that victim mentality and they will cut off communication with that attorney. And so, so a lot of times, a lot of times the, you know, the, the person with MPD will go pro se at some point, they'll start representing themselves Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. because they're the smartest person in the room. They're the, you know, (laughs) they, they know better than anybody else. And so, and their attorney wronged them. Their attorney did something to them. And so Mm -hmm. their attorney was in cahoots because we were communicating. And so there's a lot of that, um, that happens in cases where this, you know, this underlying issue is going on because they can't, they, they can only pull the wool over somebody's eyes for so long. Right. That's not that, educated. That just boggles my mind that the 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 narcissist thought that all the attorneys were in cahoots with each other because they were communicating with right. each other. That, that um okay. My my favorite my favorite answer. <laughs> my favorite answer in that particular situation when when the narcissist went pro se. Yeah. Was they were doing me 
and my client a favor because oh. they're attorneys, plural, because yeah. three or four by this point. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wasn't were inhibiting settlement. And now we would really get to the place because they were truly motivated to resolve the matter for their spouse's well being and for their children. Of course. Because they Six they were the months ones prior to the conclusion of the matter because it right. took that much longer to get to a place where they had no more runway. Oh my God. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing these stories. Uh yeah. So, um, so is it true that you encourage anyone dealing with someone with narcissistic personality, personality disorder to restrict all interactions to written communication? So is that something that you recommend? Um, and, and how come? You know, I don't, I don't know that I have a blanket recommendation, but I think inevitably that that does happen because again, you know, for us, our goal Our goal is to educate our clients about, you know, what they are going to encounter both Mm -hmm. both during the divorce process and after, because it doesn't end, especially when kids are involved. It doesn't end with the divorce. That's the next question. (laughs) they're They're going to have to deal with this person in some capacity. And so, um, you know, a lot of times it's, it's how do, how do we further, removing you from the conflict, from the dysfunction, from the toxicity as much as is humanly possible yeah. um, with the understanding that you're never going to be able to get out completely, especially when you share, share children. Yeah. Um, and, and so it does, it, it limits the, um, it limits the engagement uh, because it forces the narcissist to not, you know, not, not verbally be able to abuse somebody. They have to put it, they have to put it in writing. Um, they're going to be careful with what they put in writing um, or more careful. You know, there are, there are um, resources that we use where, you know, all communication has to be through a certain platform. There's, okay. So, so there are, there are ways in which we can go about limiting that engagement, but um, I, and, and honestly, it, I, I've done it in cases where I'm the attorney, especially where somebody's pro se, I won't yeah. communicate with them other than in writing. Okay. Um, because, you know, I'm not going to continue, you know, and, and our, our, our job is to not allow somebody with MPD to continue the abuse of our client through us. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's a, that's a big component of it. Yeah. I, I think the other piece of it too, is really working, you know, having the client work with their therapeutic resource team, having their client really understand the dynamic of communication, but being mindful too, even in the way that we communicate with a pro se or, or the adverse um, attorney who has an MPD client where how you communicate as well, because to Jamie's point, ultimately you end up with it's all written communication because there's no way to document, sadly, especially when you're in the court system, what you said or how you said it, unless it's in writing. And often the narcissist cannot control themselves. And so what you receive in writing is helpful to you and helpful to your case. And in the long term, when you look at the body of work that they present, yeah, um, because to Jamie's point, they can't hold themselves clean for so long before it comes through, but also how you communicate. Because you know, the traditional way that the system has encouraged you to quote co-parent with a narcissist is, you know, bevy of details, tons of information, you know, kind words, open forum, you know, yeah. kumbaya, and that's <laughs> not yeah. how one can communicate with a narcissist. So they develop sort of a, I don't want to call it a blueprint, like a, like a blueprint of certain responses that are designed to be effective in the system, but also to start extricating and creating those boundaries of communication where they're still having that necessary requirement that the court wants to see from them, but the manner in which they respond is is therapeutic in nature to them to help create the the delineation between themselves and the narcissist. Okay. So so you mentioned co-parenting and like I said, that was on my that was my uh, next question. So what um, advice do you give your clients when it comes to co-parenting? Because in a lot of these cases, children are involved. And if there are children involved, then this is going to go beyond the actual divorce. 
I think I think what Sarah had touched on before is really important um, because it's it's there there will be a mandatory co-parenting requirement, right? Re- regardless of what the custody arrangement yeah. is, regardless of you know who has who has primary custody, who has you know physical custody, there there is going to be a need to to communicate. It's the manner in which um, mm-hmm. the, the client is. I don't want to say trained, but, um, you know, we focus on how how to communicate in a way that is direct, that doesn't invite, you know, engagement from the other side, doesn't invite, you know, you're not you're not sending an email or a text message with, uh, you know, 50 different things on it that's just going to invite, you know, conflict. And well, well, I don't understand. You said this and this, you know, so it's just it's very direct communication. Yeah. It's limited to the issues that have to be communicated. It's understanding that, um, you know, it's not a situation where you're going to be able to have like effective co-parenting therapy because mm-hmm. that's not that's not a tool in the arsenal, and that would be just allowing the abuse to continue. Yeah. Um, so that's never a recommendation that we're going to make to somebody who's. D- divorcing a narcissist because it would be lighting your money and your emotional well-being on fire um, all at the same time, right? So um, that's, you know, it's, so understanding what you have to work with and how to best work with it in that communication. Um, The other thing that, you know, if there is a need for a custody evaluation, making sure that, you know, we're, we're selecting evaluators in the process that understand the nuances of, of, of these personality disorders um, and are going to ask the right questions and make recommendations in line with that understanding um, and communicate with the therapeutic, you know, team that's in place so that they understand the perspective that our client has. So um, I think all of those things, you know, when coupled together can really help the client learn how, you know, that A, they're going to have to, but how to best co-parent um, without without compromising their emotional well-being. Okay. I think the other thing, too, is, and, and there's been a rise in the concept of parallel parenting. Um, mm-hmm. And while it's not necessarily promoted within the system or promoted within, you know, the custodial evaluation, you know, sort of initial mindset, when, when evaluators see these type of personalities, when evaluators see high conflict, there's a lean towards, even if they're still calling it co-parenting, like the idea that they're co-parenting in parallel. So for the day-to-day caretaking, for things that are not major decisions, for sort of the gray area in parenting that can invite this type of engagement and conflict, you know, Mm -hmm. just your house is yours and my house is mine. And like, we're not really going to talk about it so much. And that Mm -hmm. we'll try to touch on some areas that may span both places, but, you know, learning how to thank you for your opinion and then whatever, like just, you know, there are certain phrases that you can use to sort of soften the pot, but also not really allow for the meat of the issue to become this web of conversation that you're having. And I think, you know, teaching people with their therapeutic team in place because their therapeutic team is likely telling them don't respond, you know, narcissists thrive on engagement. And, you know, you have us in in the reverse going, no, you kind of have to, because the court is looking for you to make sure. So like that balance between what you're saying and how many times a week you're responding and, and responding, not reacting learning to not allow the narcissist to poke the buttons and create the engagement and resp- filter right out what's important yep. and what's necessary versus what you know may 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 be personally offensive to you but that really doesn't require you to respond because they're they're looking for that yeah and in cases uh of high high conflict divorce. Um, What are your thoughts on uh, hiring a high conflict divorce coach? I mean, I I think, I think Sarah and I have probably in our professional careers had, have 
had varied experiences with divorce Mm -hmm. coaches. Some are, you know, wonderful. And I think, you know, the same things that you should be asking of your divorce attorney when you meet with them, you should be asking of a divorce coach when you meet with them, especially in a situation where you're dealing with, with these personality disorders. Um, because, because that understanding is key. Um, you know, and listen, I, I will say I, I am supportive of any outside resource that adds value to a client in the process. So as long as that, that coach is adding value to the client and then I, I think it's, it can be very helpful to filter Mm -hmm. through some of, you know, that, that conflict and, and get, you know, everybody's working working on funneling what needs to be funneled into the same place. And so, um, again, as long as you're asking the right questions and, and making sure that the person that you're engaging is, is aligned with your goals and what you, what you want to accomplish, then I think it can certainly add, you know, it can add value again, you know, we've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. So, um, you know, it's, and understanding what a divorce coach should do and shouldn't do. They're not your advocate. Yes. I think that that's a really, and and they should never be working against, if you have the right attorney in place, they should never be working against the attorney. It's, it's everybody should be rowing in the same direction. Everybody is facilitating, yes. getting somebody out of the, the situation in a way that, that preserves their emotional well-being as, as, as best we can. Yeah, I ask um, because I know it's a relatively new field, and I'm just curious to see um, what your experiences have been. You know, is that something that clients should look into when they're when they're putting in uh, they're putting together their support network? So, yeah, I, I I think the same as we sort of said before too. You know, Jamie's point about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, yeah. Who is the person that you're interviewing? What is their story? Why did they become a coach? What is their goal in providing a service to you? Do they work with your therapist? Do they talk to your legal team? Mm -hmm. Do they understand the specific state that you're in and the law related to that and the challenges that you'll face in the courthouse so that they are armed, arming you with the toolbox in the box that you're actually living in, not in some fictional, like in, in, in my state. Well, you know, cause this is a national industry, right? Like you can sure. be anywhere and be a coach. So you really yeah. need to make sure that the resource team that you're putting together is comprehensive. And to Jamie's yeah. point is all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. And that can be powerful when it happens. I mean, we've all seen like the, the unified crew team, right. With the power <laughs> sure. through the water. Yeah. One yes. row, one one person rowing in the opposite direction throws off the whole boat. So y- totally. you need to just make sure everybody is aligned. So I asked this question of all of my guests because I know I have a lot of listeners who they know they're in a toxic situation, but they're not quite ready to take that first step toward removing themselves from the relationship. What advice would you give these listeners? A, I would acknowledge that it's really difficult. It's yeah. especially when you are in the, you know, you're in a relationship with somebody who who is designed to hold you there mm-hmm. and hold you down and not support you, um, because they can't because their 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 emotional health doesn't allow them to. Um, it's really hard acknowledging that it's hard. Um, and also educating yourself, you know, really, really understand and try to understand the nuances of this type of disorder, because I think with with education comes empowerment and empowerment is a huge it's it's one of our core values in our firm. It's um, mm-hmm. something that we talk to our clients about. But that that sense of, you know, knowledge is power and and understanding and and also, you know, not not taking on the responsibility of somebody else's issues um, that again, it's like that light bulb moment. We see it all the time with, with, with individuals who have been in these relationships and it really is like, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Um, It's a beautiful thing to watch somebody through the process um, because we're, we're helping educate them and, and we're, you know, explaining what, what, you know, the, 
what the system is designed to do and what it's not. And just having that, you know, awareness, it's give yourself some grace and, yeah. and just, you know, take some, take some time to, to read and educate yourself because it really, it really does help. Yeah. I think Jamie's point about giving yourself some grace was, yeah. was directly where I was going. You can yeah. be prepared. You can be educated. You can be mindful and there will come a moment in this process where you will falter. You will quote backslide. You will do the exact opposite of all of your teachings because your instincts have been designed to be a certain way for a period of time. You've lived with this person. You had children with this person. You love this person. Yeah. You might still love this person or the idea that you believe this person could be. Mm-hmm. And it takes a long time to, this process is work. Like it's a lot of oh, yeah. work for the person who's extricating themselves because the personality that you're facing is so big. Mm-hmm. So even with this support system in place and even with all the work that you do, it, it you, you have that moment where you write the email that you shouldn't or you say the thing that you shouldn't or you're engaged because your defenses are down and you're yeah. in an emotional space and it's okay. Like, mm-hmm. that's okay. You just mm-hmm. reset from there and move forward. But like, start, put one foot in front of the other. When you're ready, you're ready and you'll know that you're ready, but you have to, you have to work your way into getting ready or you'll just sit in that space for a long time. So, and finally, how can listeners connect with you, your website, social media? Just wanted to give you that opportunity to share. Thank you. Sure. Um, website is jacobsburger.com. Our, we're on Facebook, um, Facebook slash backslash jacobsburger LLC, uh, uh, Instagram at jacobsburger LLC. Um, we're on YouTube. We're everywhere. You look for Wonderful. us there. <laughs> and, and I will say our, you know, our, our website has a lot of really good information and resources okay. for Wonderful. clients. Um, you know, it, it was something that was really important to Sarah and I in, in developing the website. Like we wanted, we wanted to have a place where clients could go and actually get information. Um, because again, we see, you know, you could have the prettiest website in the world, but if, if it's not helping clients and not, yeah. you know, giving them the information that we, we think that they deserve in this process, um, you know, that they shouldn't have to pay for until, until they have to. Right. So, yeah. um, so yeah, please, please check out all that information. Cause we think it's, we think it's valuable. I will leave links to everything in the show notes. Sarah, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been such a pleasure talking with both of you and it's been so informative, not just for me, but for, my listeners as well. So thank you again for all the work that you do. Thanks Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Sarah Jacobs and Jamie Berger on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Sarah and Jamie, I've left links to their website and social media in the show notes. If you would like to share your own emotional abuse story here on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out at hello at sereneleadsrights.com via our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real, or through Instagram at sereneleadsrights. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 88788. Once again, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. Sign up for my free newsletter. And if you can, please support us through our Buy Me a Coffee page. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.